Hey guys, and welcome back. So today we are covering another solved case from Perth. And this happened about five years ago. And and I don't say this lightly. This has to be one of the worst, if if not the worst case I have ever covered on this channel. I felt physically ill researching for today's case and I'm actually quite surprised it's not a more well-known case outside of Western Australia. At least I don't think it is. And it is one I have wanted to discuss with you guys for a while. And I do actually remember quite clearly when this case was unraveling because it actually happened the week I started this channel, my crime channel. But I've always felt a certain way about covering very recent cases or cases that are currently unfolding in the media. We don't have all the information, you know, other channels, they can do what they want. I'm not shading anyone. It's just me personally. I just feel a bit strange about it. And honestly, even covering it now, five years later, I've gone back and forth as to whether it's the right time, but there has been a trial and we have a conclusion and I'm going to try to cover this with as much respect as I can, as I always do. But having said that, let's get into today's solved case. So today we're discussing the Harvey family from Western Australia. Anthony and Mara met back in 2013 when Anthony was just 20 years old and Mara was 36 and they were both working on a mine site called Cape Preston, or I think they were working near Cape Preston, a mine site I am all too familiar with. If you guys are new here, I'm a flight attendant in Western Australia. Cape Preston, not my favorite place. But anyway, <laughs> so despite this relatively large age gap between the pair, they got along really well, started dating and eventually fell in love. And the following year, Mara fell pregnant. And it wasn't long following her pregnancy announcement that Anthony actually proposed. Soon the pair were married and by 2015, Mara gave birth to their daughter, Charlotte. And the next year, Mara was actually pregnant again, which she was so happy and so excited about. She'd always wanted a large family, according to her sister. And this time, super excitingly, she was pregnant with twins and she went on to have two more girls, Alice and Beatrix. By 2018, the couple, now aged 25 and 41, had both quit working on the mine sites and had settled into a more stable family life here in Perth. If you guys aren't aware, the way working on mine sites works here in WA, Western Australia, is it's very much a fly-in, fly-out job. So you may be away for a week and home for a week. And of course, this this doesn't really work with, I don't want to say it doesn't work with family. It definitely becomes more difficult with a family. It's doable, but obviously pros and cons, you have to weigh them up. And obviously Mara wanted to stay home and therefore I guess Anthony also decided to stay home. And the mine site life, FIFO, is well paid, but again, it has its disadvantages, and that is that you're away from friends and family. And they moved into a house on Cood Street in the suburb of Bedford, and this is actually a street and a suburb I'm super familiar with. I don't live there. Uh, I just grew up in their area. Many of my friends grew up in their area. I went to school close to their area. So I very much know this house or I, I knew this house. I have no association with this family, but I know the area, which kind of makes this story even more unsettling for me. Or this story is unsettling for anyone that hears it. It Anyway. So Mara was clearly a really smart woman because she actually made a few investments during her time working on the mines. As I mentioned, mining, well, mine site working, good money. I don't know how many houses or pieces of land or whatever she purchased, but she purchased a couple. So when she came back to live in Perth permanently and leave that way of living, she actually decided to sell up a couple of them or try to sell up all of them by the sounds of it 
And she did this to fund her husband, Anthony's new business venture, which was a lawn mowing business. And by the way, I think the house they also moved into on Coo Street was one of those investments. But anyway, this lawn mowing business or franchise was under the Jim's Mowing Company franchise. If you're from Australia, you all know what I'm talking about. Jim's is everywhere. It's Jim's Mowing, Jim's Moving, Jim's Insect getting what is it called pest control (laughs) you got gyms cleaning and gyms dog washing basically gyms has basically basically gyms has kind of taken over the entire country at this point anyone outside of australia is going to literally wonder what the heck i'm talking about right now but if you're an aussie you know so (laughs) that is basically the franchise that Anthony bought a gyms mowing franchise and according to i don't know if it was jim himself or somebody named Jim that worked under the Jim's company, the Jim's banner. He said that Anthony was a well-respected and well-liked franchisee. But unfortunately, things were going a little bit slow with Anthony's mowing business. So Mara got a job at their local Coles supermarket. And from what I understand, Anthony wasn't exactly the hardest worker, nor was he very good with money. So Mara basically made the decision to take over the family's finances as far as, you know, making sure they had enough money to cover all the finances and expenses for all five of them. And this included giving Anthony an allowance each week, which he apparently resented. And there were a few other issues within their relationship or their situation but I will get into that a little bit later but despite their struggles Mara absolutely loved being a mother and she she thrived in her role I think by the sound of it it's something she had waited her whole life to be according to her sister Taryn Topman her three girls were really her entire world and it's clear that having this wonderful role model like Mara really reflected in each of these girl's unique personalities. Taryn described the oldest, Charlotte, as energetic, bubbly, and a confident little girl who loved people and loved socializing. And Alice as outgoing, adventurous, and cheeky, while Beatrix was a little bit more quiet, but gave the biggest hugs. And Mara's 73-year-old mother, Beverly Ann Quinn, described as a kind-hearted and caring woman, would also pop around to their home frequently to help her daughter and son-in-law out with the three kids. So on Saturday, September 8, Anthony Harvey got in his car and made the very long drive up to visit his father in the Pilbara town of Panawanika, which is near Karatha for my WA locals, and is also about a 14 and a half hour drive. So quite the hefty journey. Upon arriving, he said to his dad, I've done something really wrong, dad. I hurt them all. I miss them. He then divulged to his father exactly what he had done and his father immediately phoned the police. And on Saturday, September 9, Anthony Harvey officially turned himself into a police station in the Pilbara and was taken into custody in Karatha. There, Harvey confessed to killing his wife, whom during his confession, he described as a fantastic wife and a supportive and good mother as well as killing his mother-in-law, Beverly, and his three young and innocent children, three-year-old Charlotte, and the twins, two-year-olds, Alice and Beatrix. He told police he was not mad or even angry when he killed his entire family, and in fact, he described his marriage as good. So what exactly had gone wrong here? Back in Perth, the police immediately went to the Cood Street home where they found the bodies of Mara, Beverly and the three young girls. The bodies had been covered in blankets and flowers with Mara and her girls placed on the bed in the girls' bedroom. And Mara's body in particular had been moved into a position where it appeared like she was cuddling her three daughters and surrounding the girls were their favourite toys. Beverly was placed in a similar manner, but was on the kitchen floor. Even more disturbingly, a letter was placed on the bodies, written by Anthony Harvey, that read, in part, To my beautiful wife, I'm so sorry. 
I would give anything to undo what I've done. I think I've lost my mind. I remember what I have done, but there is no reason behind it. I don't know, but I remember doing it. Oh God, I'm so sorry. Movement is now life and I must go. Take care of those girls like you always do. I love you so much. Yours forever. Police would also find Polaroid photographs that Harvey had taken of the bodies as well as a diary that outlined his plan to murder and his mental state around this time. But I'll get more into his diary in just a moment. And the crime scene shook up and disturbed even the most hardened police officers. Some were even seen crying out on the front lawn. While journalists writing about this story even wrote of how they struggled to cover it without breaking down. And neighbours, they spoke of how lovely the Harvey family was and what good neighbours they were. There was nobody that heard about this crime that was not affected in some way, shape or form, especially if you lived here locally. And it wasn't long before tributes started flowing and strangers were leaving flowers and teddy bears and cards outside of the home. And it was also strangers that donated money for the funerals of the five victims that were now needing to be arranged. So let's rewind to the week previous and go through the events that took place. Sunday, September 2nd had actually been Father's Day and the Harvey family was home that day enjoying a lunch together while the children played in the backyard laughing and just having a good time and neighbours would later recall hearing the children's laughter coming from the backyard that afternoon which I think you know is what made this crime all the more shocking because from the outside This family was not perfect, because no family is, but it seemed pretty close to, you know, a very happy family. Nothing seemed out of place. People saw, you know, Mara and Anthony and the kids together. The kids seemed happy. The kids were laughing and smiling and playing. Just one day before all of this unraveled. So the next day was a Monday and it was pretty regular Monday for the Harvey family. Anthony was replying to some business emails and Mara had a shift at Coles doing the night fill. So that night, Anthony sat at home and the girls were home as well and they were sound asleep while Anthony sat by himself, drank half a bottle of wine and waited for his wife to arrive home. On this day, he wrote in his diary, I embrace my darkness and animal instincts. I'm no psycho. I feel, I feel too much. I always have. I will regret what I do. And he added, tonight I will kill my wife, bludgeon and smother her to death. Then the real hunting begins. When Mara walked in the door that evening at around 11.30pm, her husband very quickly pounced on her, hitting her over the head violently with a pipe until she became unconscious. He then stabbed her a total of 12 times. And this knife, which was described as about the size of a machete, which, to be fair, I don't know how big a machete is technically, but it's pretty freaking huge, had been purchased just days earlier. And then Harvey moved on to his daughter's bedroom. Uh, From what I can tell, the girls slept in the same bedroom bedroom but I'm not really sure on this fact. So Harvey went and grabbed a smaller knife and this was also a knife that he had recently purchased and he would like to say he grabbed a smaller knife because they were quote just little girls. He then crept into where they were sleeping and stabbed all three of them repeatedly. First Beatrix, then Alice and last the oldest Charlotte who was found with a total of 38 stab wounds, which is just unbelievable. The amount of anger somebody has to have within within them to, to do that to not only a child, but your own child. It's, I don't even want to ponder this point or discuss it too much because it is truly incomprehensible to me and sickening beyond belief. 
th- there's no words. Th- there just aren't. This whole case has no words. Following his wife's and children's murder, Harvey took a shower and went to sleep, dozing off into a slumber as if nothing had happened. And the next morning, he made an attempt to clean up some of the blood before his mother-in-law, Beverly, showed up. And he actually helped Beverly bring a few things in the house from her car before Beverly very unfortunately met the same fate as her daughter. And as I said, Beverly would often come over and help out with the kids. So unfortunately, I would imagine that she was just a person that got in the way in this case. He then had a shower, had a nap, and went and he drove to get some coffee before attending two mowing jobs that he had lined up for that day. Again, acting as if literally nothing had even happened. It's as though he had completely disassociated from the events that had occurred. And with that, in less than 24 hours, Anthony Harvey had committed one of the worst mass killings that Western Australia had ever seen and wiped out three generations of women. And believe it or not, the details that I have outlined thus far for you are just the tip of the iceberg. Some of the details of this case were so disturbing and so gruesome, a suppression order had to be put in place to ban the publication of these details. And when this story hit the headlines, hit the media in Western Australia, it hit particularly hard because just months earlier, another mass killing had taken place in WA in a small town down south. A man named Peter Mills had shot his wife, daughter and four grandchildren before taking his own life. And this was the worst shooting incident in the country since Port Arthur, the Port Arthur Massacre in 1996. Uh, And I will say 2018 was really a terrible year for Western Australia when it came to mass killings and family killings and it just and there was was a succession of a couple of them within a couple of months there and it was just it was just a horrendous time for everybody in the community it really it was and it was shocking especially because we don't really see gun violence in in Australia but yeah there really there's no words Over the next several days, Harvey would do things like call Mara's work and make excuses for her absence. He also sold off some of his own possessions, some of his family's possessions, some women's jewellery, I'm assuming Mara's or maybe Beverly's jewellery, all for cash in hand. And he also withdrew money from Mara's bank account. And he'd actually only been given access to this bank account days earlier after persuading Mara to give him this access. You may remember me mentioning at the beginning, he wasn't great with finances. In fact, so bad that Mara had taken over and gave him his weekly allowance, which again, apparently he resented. So somehow he convinced her to give him this access days before these killings happened. And that's how he managed to drain her bank account as well as draining his own bank account. And in total, I believe he got about $40,000 in total from selling things and draining both of their bank accounts. Of course, these actions, you know, selling off items, accumulating a large sum of money, which a lot of it sounded like it was cash in hand, does beg the question, did Anthony Harvey plan to live his life on the run? And I would say that would be a resounding yes. Of course, at some point he must have began this drive and somehow at some point began driving in the direction of his father's home, which as I said, was like a 14 and a half hour drive. And I would like to think that maybe guilt got the better of him, but I don't think guilt is a word in this man's vocabulary. And quite frankly, even calling him a man is is laughable. It really is. All in all, Anthony Harvey calmly, carefully, and meticulously planned and carried out these murders, as well as an escape plan over a one-week period, like only a truly, truly evil, through and through evil person 
could possibly be capable of. And it was only after eating, sleeping and living in the home in his Bedford home with his five deceased family members' bodies that he decided to confess to his father what he had done. The fact that he stayed in that house for five days with his deceased family, his young girls, and he slept and he ate and he lived and he planned. <laughs> I, I, I really am lost for words in this case. I, I've written notes as I always do and even as I'm reading them back out loud to you guys and after I've you know spent the last week researching this case <laughs> even now reading it out loud again completely not only enrages me but baffles me and anyway let's continue on with this story because I'm sure you are all feeling exactly the same as I am right now so let's try to unpack some of what we have discussed so far as well as discuss the diary that I mentioned before. So of course, this crime was particularly horrific and heinous for many, many reasons, including the fact, as we just said, the killer, Harvey, stayed in the house with his victims for an entire week before leaving. And he also carried out acts that would usually signify, or normally, for a normal person, signify remorse, such as leaving flowers and cards and toys around the bodies of a victim. He also confessed to these crimes within one week and made little to no attempt to cover up what he had done. He had tried to make a run for it. He didn't do a very good job. You know, he, it's not like he was missing for weeks or days or he drove as far as I'm aware, straight to his father's house and confessed. Like this confession didn't have to be dragged out of him by the police, nothing. And for a family annihilator case, from what we've seen in the past, this is very unusual behavior. You know, we've got the ones we all know, like the Chris Watts case, or you have the uh, Mornington, I don't know if you guys will remember this. I covered it a few years ago, the Mornington Monster. It was a John Sharp case, basically not so dissimilar to the Chris Watts case. John Sharp killed his entire family in a place that was close to Melbourne. Look it up, won't go over it here. But basically in these cases, we see the same pattern. The, usually the male, you know, the father will kill his entire family, dispose of the bodies and then report to the police that their family is missing. Then, you know, they go on TV, they have a cry about it, they plead for any information for the public and then we eventually find out that they are the ones that killed their entire family. And, you know, they say, oh, I didn't do it, I'm innocent. That, that seems to be the normal passion. Where Anthony Harvey doesn't follow the normal passion of any... Not only any killer, but any like family annihilator or anything to that effect. It's just such a unusual one. And of course, I'm no psychiatrist. I'm no expert. I don't know why he did what he did. But what I can do in this video is bring you the facts. And then I guess you can form your own opinions or make your own decisions. And of course, as you may have guessed, this was a premeditated murder which was planned about one month in advance, according to his diary, the fact that he had purchased the knives just days before the murders. And it's also a fact that he did confirm during a psychiatric evaluation later down the track. And his diary also gave us a more clear indication of not only his plans, but his mental state. And as I read, I'm not gonna read every single entry in this video or we will be here forever, but I'm gonna read the ones that stood out to me, I suppose. And I think it really paints a picture of somebody that was unstable, of course, for one. You have to be somewhat unstable to do what he did. But I mean, unhappy. And I'm not saying that unhappy people kill their family, but let me just read you the entries that I thought stood out and then we'll discuss. So in one entry, he writes about unshackling the darkness inside of him by eliminating his family. And in another entry, he also writes a post-murder to-do list again, indicating that he had somewhat planned this out quite meticulously. He wrote, call Mara's work, fake injury, 
call Andrew, give away all jobs, call girls school, deaf interstate. I don't know if what DEF deaf interstate stands for, defer interstate. I'm, I would have thought maybe he was planning to be on the run interstate. So maybe it, something to do with that. I'm probably really dumb and all of you are shouting at it. It's short for this. He meant this. But anyway, that's what he had written or wrote. He also wrote some alternative options to killing his family. He wrote, leave unannounced slash seek divorce equals the least heat. Under that, he wrote, making entire family disappear equals no money. And lastly, he wrote, Eliminate family and embezzle funds equals prep. So it's like he had considered divorce, but he thought, no, you know what? You know what's easier? I'm just going to kill my entire family and disappear. That's the logical explanation. Of course, I'm being very sarcastic. The way he, I guess there must be something wrong within him for him to come to the conclusion that this was the solution to his unhappiness. He also did continue to lay out plans and possible conundrums that he may come across, including writing, quote, biggest problem, money and how to successfully clear our bank accounts. Not concerned with trace, just need the coin. So cash city, multiple transfer, big risk, body in trailer, body in veggie patch, body in bed, sell car, hawk valuables, withdraw money, buy incognito car, buy a dog slash dogs, leave, end quote. And of course, I think we can all agree that this is pretty damning evidence. He clearly planned to get rid, of his, get rid of his family in some way, shape or form and be on the run for some amount of time. I mean, my best guess is he didn't become guilty. He became scared. He was a chicken. Well, I think we can all agree that this guy was, he was a sad, scared little man. I don't, I can't think of a better word for it right now. Pathetic. He was pathetic. You know, he couldn't hack this life on the run. He couldn't hack what he had done. And it took him literally after he left his home with all this money, with this plan, this grand plan to be on the run for as long as he could get away with it. And it, he could have got away with it for, I'd say a couple of weeks, you know, but he was too scared and I'm glad. So overall, the general gist of his entries besides the plans were the fact he was unhappy in his quote, boring life. He was unhappy in his job and he was unhappy with society in general. And he was motivated to do what he did to quote, end the boring, endless circle. Basically wanted to cut himself loose and disappear at any cost. And in his final entry before fleeing up north, he wrote, quote, I wouldn't even say it was a decision so much. It was just something that was going to happen. I hadn't planned this, but I think on some level, I must have known when she went to work. I mentioned before about these ideas I got when I was quite low in my depression and it wasn't necessarily hurting Mara or it was, it wasn't about hurting anyone. Sometimes it was just about running away. Sometimes it was, it was offing myself. Sometimes it was whatever and it manifested itself this time as hurting everyone that I love, end quote. Outside of these personal diary entries, however, there was seemingly no clear indication of what was to come. But I think there were some indicators that Anthony Harvey was a bit of a rubbish parent and a rubbish partner. According to a couple of articles I read months after this crime happened, a couple of Harvey's friends came forward and one of them described him as, quote, lazy and drunk and high and wanted to spend all of his time having fun and partying instead of being a dad. He thought his wife and his children were cramping his style, end quote. Another friend said that he hated being a father, he never wanted to be a father, and he didn't even like his own children. And friends even mentioned that he'd actually struggled to be a father when Charlotte was first born because it wasn't something by the sound of it that he was expecting, especially Again, remembering the age gap, I sound like I'm defending him now. You guys know I'm not. I'm just trying to explain maybe where his head was at or I'm trying to understand where his head was at because I think in these sort of cases, we want to try and understand on some level why someone does what they do or did what they did. Uh, he was in his early 20s. She was late 30s. Chances are he wasn't ready for fatherhood. He wanted to go out, party, have fun and one minute he's doing that, the next minute he's tied down, you know, and then a year later, twins. <laughs> Probably not something that he had 
imagined. But you know, as a man, he made these decisions. These were, this is nothing that he was forced into. We all make a choice when we are with somebody in a committed, hopefully loving relationship. And if this is not something that you want, you should be communicating this clearly with a partner, you know, and it's something that he signed up for willingly or unwillingly. I don't know, but regardless, these were his children and he should have taken responsibility. If he was that truly unhappy, A, he should have got help, but B, he should have left, got a divorce like a normal person. And some friends mentioned that, well, after they had Charlotte and their sort of situation was rocky, their finances were rocky, they were sort of struggling as a couple and as parents. Mara thought that by getting pregnant again, this might bring their family closer together. Of course, as you can imagine, bringing now twins into the mix, not that she knew she'll get pregnant with twins, only added more strain to this entire situation. And there was one friend that claimed that by the last year of their marriage, Harvey had developed quite an expensive meth and marijuana habit. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but wouldn't be surprised. But as I said, it just sounds like to me that he, there's a lot of people that are put in situations in life where they don't cope and we all react differently to situations that we don't know how to handle. He very quickly went from being a single young man to a husband and a father and, you know, the breadwinner of the family. And I'm going to hazard a guess that something inside him snapped. I mean, there was clearly something wrong with this man where he didn't know or understand how like a, a normal, quote unquote, normal person would cope in this situation, or I should say a mentally stable person, how they would cope in this situation. There seemed to be, a, you know, in accordance with his diary, some dark and disturbed voice in his head telling him that, you know, I guess a murder was the answer. That's sort of a logical answer. It's, it doesn't sound like he really grappled with the idea too much. And if you as an individual thinks that this is a logical solution to your struggles. I don't know what is happening inside your brain, but he needed to seek help. And I wish, honestly, I wish he did receive help. I wish he had gotten help, gotten the help that he needed because he clearly needed it. I think I'm grappling with this because we're about to talk about the trial and I would say that we don't get many answers. The, the outcome of this trial is good, but we don't get answers and we never do get answers as to why he did what he did. And I think that's what makes this case for me and probably for you guys as well, a very difficult one to comprehend because there's no clear, distinct why, clear, distinctive answer as to why this person that seemed like a family man on the outside would annihilate his entire family in a calm, concise planned out manner, staying in the house, writing the letters. The, oh, there's, there's so much of this case. I, I can't comprehend in my brain. I can't. So as I said, now we're going to discuss the trial, which was conducted by Justice Stephen Hall, who was also the same judge that conducted the Claremont serial killer trial. And as the gruesome details of the murders were read out in court, Anthony Harvey put his head down and his hands over his ears as to not hear the details of his own crimes, which I think says a lot about him. And he did plead guilty with his lawyers arguing that his guilty plea along with his age, as well as his prospects for rehabilitation, meant that he didn't deserve a life sentence without a defined minimum term. Harvey also claimed to be remorseful, which were claims that Justice Hall just were not buying into. A psychiatrist report found that Harvey didn't actually suffer with any mental health issues or psychological issues, although he did suffer from bouts of depression and anxiety, which he mentioned the depression in his uh, diary. The report did state, however, that he potentially had narcissistic personality disorder or autism but from what I can tell neither of these were confirmed it was just a possibility I don't even know if it was a probability to be honest it doesn't sound like it but yeah he wasn't officially diagnosed with either of these most notably though in my opinion this report stated that Harvey would often try to escape into a fantasy world of serial killers and had become obsessed with the idea of becoming one himself. 
It also noted that Harvey's actions were most likely linked to his desire to escape his own reality. So what we were just talking about, like his responsibilities as a father, as a husband, and any any other general responsibilities he had. Now, they said, Harvey never did explain why he did what he did at any point. All we really have to go off is his diary, which I think, in my opinion, was sort of nonsensical and rambly at best. I I did read you some of the passages, so I mean, you tell me what you think, but I guess he was somewhat explaining his, where his head was at, but there was no real true explanation that was logical to explain why you would do, why he would do what he did. There just wasn't. But Anthony Harvey did go on to be the first person in Western Australia to receive a term of life imprisonment with an order that stated never to be released. And actually up until 2008, such a sentence had not even been allowed in the state of Western Australia. And until 2019, it had never actually been implemented. And in fact, this sentence was introduced because of the Sophia Rodriguez Urataya Shu slash Dante Arthur's case. I covered it a couple of years back. It was basically about a young girl eight years old, Sophia, she was abducted in a shopping center during the afternoon in broad daylight, uh, dragged into a disabled toilet cubicle and killed within minutes. And as you can imagine, this case not only sent shockwaves through the entire city, everyone in Perth, but it sent the fear of God through every single parent bringing their young child to a shopping center because how many parents feel pretty comfortable just to let their child wander off to the disabled toilets for like two minutes. Um, But anyway, if you want to see anything about that case, I'll try to remember to link it down below for you. It's an incredibly sad one. But that case was really the reason that they brought, not brought back, but they introduced the life sentence with no possibility of parole, which is fantastic, of course. And this is so far the first and I think only person that has received life meaning life in prison. So that was a great result. And at the trial, Justice Hall stated, quote, there is not a case that is truly comparable. Frankly, I struggle to find words that are adequate to convey the magnitude of your offenses. Your actions are so far beyond the boundaries of acceptable human conduct that they instill horror and revulsion into even the most hardened of people. It is necessary to make an order that you never be released in order to meet the community's interest in punishment and deterrence. And in a first for this channel, I can actually honestly say that the Australian justice system did its job. So... Round of applause for the Australian justice system. Two weeks later, Anthony Harvey did appeal his sentence, labeling it unreasonable, but he did eventually drop his appeal. And their Bedford home on Cood Street has since been demolished as it really should be. Um, Yeah, this was a difficult one to discuss, to research, to get through. I mean, I think you could tell when I was even, you know, relaying this story to you, I was struggling and rambling a bit and trying to come up with an answer or a a reason. There just sometimes isn't one and you have to accept that, I guess. Uh, But let me know your thoughts down below. I think I've talked enough today. Until next time, stay vigilant and stay safe.